If it's Aussie and it rocks, it's right here. This is Triple M's Homegrown with Matty O. Yes, right around the country on the Triple M network. That's 52 stations and on the brand new listener app. This is an absolute treat because since 2011, I mean, where do I start? A man who's done it all. A writer, performer, composer, podcaster. You'd be blown away if you've seen him performing live. Sold out shows across Australia oh. and the UK. You've watched him on the ABC Netflix too. Everything's a drum. Everything's a drum. Everything's a drum. Everything's a drum. Hey, did you know my tum's a drum? Auntie Donna's big house of fun. Of course, it's Netflix too. Auntie Donna. Let's add songwriter composer to that. <laughs> And like myself, a diehard footy fan. And why wouldn't you be? It's a good time. And we welcome them to Listener, one of the best podcasts you'll hear. (laughs) We welcome to Triple M's home grown right now, Mr... Roden Kelly from Arnie oh It's a pleasure to have you here, man. That's one of the best intros <laughs> I've ever received. If I ever get married, can you just do that? You know him from this and just like a beautiful Triple M intro. Uh, man, it is it is such a pleasure to have you on. Uh, people oh. people that have listened to our show saw that we got a, like a brief cameo in your uh, Auntie Dana uh, clip that you had out the other day. And the response was mm. massive, man. And I think what we all kind of learned is Auntie Donna fans are so <laughs> engaging, right? Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. like it's a full thing. They're very positive too. Like we've we've kind of, I feel like we've built a fan base that are really positive and supportive, like and like things. That's my vibe on them. So, but yeah, no, a lot of people around Australia, a lot of people love Triple M, love Arnie Donner. I'm sure of it. It's There's crossover. Combo. Hey, going back, uh, kind of through that montage of things, like two, things to since 2011. Yeah. Uh, does that kind of feel like yesterday, or does it feel like a lifetime ago no, when you kind of started? I, I'm starting to have that moment. I'm 34 now, and we started when yeah, when I would have been 30. Uh, well, I think it was 12, and yeah. uh, it feels <laughs> it feels like yesterday. But then also, I'm like, how quickly did that happen? How quickly? Like my 20s are just gone. Yeah, and. Uh, I remember thinking when we started, like, I'm just going to dedicate my 20s to try and make a career out of being a performer nice. and being a creative and um, and then put my head down. Now I look up and it's, and it's, yeah, over, it's and it happened. It's crazy. It's, it's, it's actually bizarre, but um, I'm, I'm really proud of what we've done. It's been a, been a, been a cool decade. <laughs> University of Ballarat. Did you guys ever hit up the Corova Lounge? Back oh, the day? <laughs> Maddie. <laughs> Shout outs to all the locals in Melbourne who have been to Ballarat's Corova Lounge. Oh, it was the, it was the place. It was really cool, actually. Um, and the Ballarat locals will know this, right? Is every cool band from like two, in the mid two thousands and in the teens as well would do their warm up shows for Melbourne and lots of other places at the Corova. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we got the biggest bands in every every genre. Yeah, like Berserker. I remember I saw in that room, <laughs> yeah. and uh, I think you guys. I think I saw. Yeah, my we saw every few weeks we saw Vasco era. Yeah, they're, they're all, they're, always <laughs> yeah, playing there. A short trip from Melbourne. Yeah, and lots of hip hop, lots of Aussie hip hop, Earth Boy yeah. and Horror Show and. Oh, it was the best times. And it's also, it is famously the stickiest venue <laughs> in the world. I remember they'd be handing out like Jaeger shots, but in like, they used to, you know how you have like throwaway disposable plastic shot cups? <laughs> yeah. They would use them as like, they dishwash them and then use them again. <laughs> right. It was the most, yeah, no, but shout out Corova. When you would, um, cause you were performing, would you, would you find that kind of inspiring watching young bands come to town and like, oh, yeah. and perform and see that they're kind of putting in the grind, which is what you guys kind of did at the start. Yeah. When you're at uni, you just look up to everyone who's doing what you're doing. You think they're so impressive and so cool. And I remember meeting some people from my, like my favorite hip hop duo called Horror Show and like, nice. and, and Vasco and lots of other people and thinking that's so, that's so far away from me. That's so unachievable to be like a famous performer. Yeah. It will never happen. And then you realize that like the only difference between most people and them is just lots of hard work and lots yeah. of practice and like, and, th- and, w- and then we performed, we did a band, we did an, we made an album and we, we toured it there and made a real point of playing Corova. Yeah. And, um, that was really, really cool as well. But we thought there was more backstage area. No, it's next to the stage. Yeah. There's literally nothing. In fact, like they gave us a green room, but it was at a, it was at a pub 
a 15-minute walk away called Irish Murphy's. Yeah, 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 upstairs. Yeah. <laughs> so you had to have dinner and hang out in some function room yeah. down the road and then walk to the venue. Yeah, who's ready to play after all this Guinness? <laughs> yeah, exactly right. And a Palmer, beautiful. Where do you kind of start performing yeah. in, in theatre? Like, how does that kind of- like- that, was, that was all of our dream, right? Was, I was just the music theatre kid. I loved musicals at school and then yeah. I went to acting school and I was like, actually, I don't like musicals. I love Shakespeare. I'm going to be a full-time- Shakespeare actor when I graduate because I thought that was a huge industry and I thought that people could just be <laughs> Shakespeare actors. Not not just an actor, yeah. but a particular <laughs> Shakespeare actor who only ever speaks in iambic pentameter. And then I got out of school and we started to put on independent plays because that's nice. what we'd been sort of drilled and trained to do. And I remember just finding it difficult to get anyone from my family to come and see the shows. <laughs> yeah. We did a... Um, Zach and I and, an, and another mate did a play called The Dumb Waiter by Harold Pinter, a very serious theatre show. Tell us all about it. And it was in a 30-seater and we did a whole week and we worked really, really hard <laughs> on getting this show up and we're like, this is going to be really, really special theatre. We put it on. It was fine. And then like it finished and we went, well, that nothing, nothing happened. No one <laughs> was like, there was no growth. And then a few of us who liked doing the funny stuff at uni look, sort of looked to the right and saw that there's a gigantic international comedy festival in the city that we grow up in and yeah. live in. And we're like, well, we do funny things. Maybe we yeah. could put a, maybe we could take all that theater training that we just, we just paid a massive amount of hex debt for. <laughs> yeah. And we could sort of funnel that towards the comedy festival. So we, we, we got into a, a, into a rehearsal space, never, never wrote before. We'd never written anything before. We just had sort of confidence yeah. And uh, learned to kind of write on the fly. And then we put this show on, thought it would go nowhere. And we ended up getting nominated for an award called Whoa. the Golden Gibbo. Yeah. And we we're like, holy hell. We, and the show we put on, we had no, like, some would argue we still don't have any comedic <laughs> skills. But, like, we just kind of put on a show and went, this is good. And believe us that it's good. And yeah. a lot of, and the, you know, I, I don't know if it's the same with performing in a band. But if you just go on stage and say, we're awesome. Yeah. That's like. 80% of the work done. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and then that, and then we kind of kept building and building and just working really hard. And this thing, when we started, uh, we, we were like, let's build a whole career. You do live, t- you do live shows and then eventually you get a TV show. That's the way that, that's the way it goes. Yeah. But, um, so we're like, that's, that's our process. But then as we were trying to get a TV show very early on, or like, you know, get in front of important producers and yeah. managers and stuff, yeah. we were sort of on the side putting these videos up on this new website called YouTube. Yes. And people were liking the videos and watching them. Yep. And then we realized they, they're coming to the shows. And when we tell them a show's on, they, they come to the show. Yeah. And we're like, hang on, I thought you had to have a TV show or you had to have producers and stuff. And we were like, no, you just kind of need to make good content. And it was the start of the world now, which yeah. is it's entirely people have massive fan bases purely from just talking to them on YouTube or TikTok or Instagram or whatever. Yeah. Shout outs to one of the first videos you put up. Obviously I will be man beast. Oh, great. <laughs> man beast. It's, it's yeah. a good offer. It's a, it's That's an a offer. man beast. That's not a good offer. It's an offer. Well, it's actually- I should be man beast. <laughs> we'll go with something more physical. physical and so yeah. haircut. Is it weird, like, revisiting those old skits? I imagine it's like a musician yeah. revisiting, like, an old song. It's it's kind of got that magic, does it? Because it's in its time. But, you know, you can access it now. I'm just watching my hairline in every one of those videos and going, look where it was. <laughs> but then also, that's the most echoey room in the world. Yeah, it was. Did you guys have mics on for that? <laughs> no. I, no, I, get, I imagine it was a friend with a microphone on a broom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Imagined. But that was actually a trailer for, for a show. Like, we used to make funny skits as trailers. Yeah. And people would come off that. So, yeah, and that, that character, Man Beast, ended up being like a big fan favorite. That's Just so off cool. a fun trailer. When was there, was there a moment where you were just like, oh, this is really kind of taking off? Like, I guess it's like the equivalent to maybe like a band selling out a show or getting yeah. a record deal. Was there a moment where you're just like, man, we've got all this momentum now and it's it's working? Yeah. Do you know what's funny, right? Is you in, in the Hollywood kind of story is that there's a moment where it happens. But our experience has kind of been more... Gradual, and there's there's very rarely these moments where you go, "Holy hell, we broke through today." It's just moment by moment, you just like step by step, you know, a new fan there, a new fan there, a new video. Yeah, and it takes the kind of once you realise that you can build a career just slowly, it takes the pressure off it as well. Because yeah, when you whenever we put a video up, I'd hope that it would be the one that would send us viral, and you know, yeah. and then the phone would start ringing. But it was it was moment by moment. There's moments where like I remember the first time. I think the best venue in Australia just about is the Enmore Theatre, not only for comedy, but for, 
music as well. Like, yeah. it's it's one of the best venues in Australia. I remember we filled that, and I thought this is one of the coolest things, yeah. coolest things ever. When we, we the way our Netflix show happened was kind of incredible. Where like we were struggling to get anyone to look at our stuff in Australia to give us a TV show, and the doors were closed pretty cl- pretty quickly because mm. um we were weird, and we uh, we started because we had this YouTube following. We started to put our toe into the overseas market and start to tour there. And we were in LA. We were um, doing. We'd, we'd sold out a couple of shows in America from having online audience. Yeah. And we showed up. The people, the Netflix executives, came to that show and 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 saw us performing live. And it was after years and years of working really, really hard. Yeah. And we kind of we we were, we'd had our ten thousand hours almost done. We knew what we were doing. And so we pitched to them, and they went, "Yeah, you know what you're doing. Uh, have six episodes of a show." <laughs> Whoa. And that was a real moment like, cause every, to that point, everything had been, you know, s- you know, reaching and scratching yeah, for yeah, any yeah. opportunity. And then just a cool place like Netflix went, yeah, we'll give you a chance. And that was a huge moment. Like it was transformative as far as the way, you know, that people that we reached around the world in a moment. And, uh, and then when we did our next tour, the amount of people who all of a, all of a sudden yeah. knew who we were, we, I think we sold out Australia in like a day. Dude, and, you've and, done that recently as yeah, well. Yeah, and the like, world tour we just put on sale. We're like, maybe because it was like two and a half years since the show came out. We're like, maybe everyone's forgotten us and doesn't know who we are. And then we sold it out. And we're like, oh, okay, good. People remember us. <laughs> so that I think those were the two moments. I think the day we got the phone call and they went, yeah, you can have six episodes. See you soon. <sighs> So what's 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 the kind of process from there? Like uh, we mm. spoke just before, you relocated to LA, and yeah, what was bizarre? Man. Is it like being in a movie? Is it how you kind of imagine it is? You know, watching <laughs> you know those big films and lots of people around the camera crews, and it was it was kind of scary actually because they flew us all to Australia, America, yeah, and they gave me a jeep and a house, and they're like really? live here <laughs> and have this jeep. Whoa! And I lived with um, Tom, who makes all our music, and I made uh, I made um. Uh, and, and, and Max, our director. And then we, um, you know, they sort of just went, yeah, go right here. Ed Helms was our product, was our producer for the show. And we, um, just kept making it. And then we kind of looked around and we saw it was like a big budget show and we had this whole crew of Americans. <laughs> and then it was just the same boys from the <laughs> rehearsal space in Melbourne, yeah, yeah, like yeah. eight or nine years earlier. And we went, we're not, we're not supposed to be doing this. <laughs> someone's, someone's made a horrible, horrible mistake. Yeah. But, um. It was it was funny. As big as the production got, it really was just us at the same time. Dude, I love that. Is mm. how'd you go like uh, creatively? Was it is it easy being in a different space, or do you kind of you know riding on the road and, and yeah, being that's a, true. Was there pressure or it was kind of the same to be honest? That's the same nice. thing as we were in a high rise in Hollywood, making writing in a writing room, and you could see out over the Hollywood Hills from our writing space. Whoa. But then the post its were the same on the wall. It was like Mister Pooh <laughs> poos his pants or something <laughs> stupid, like because it's uh, uh, what what's been really cool, and I'm, I imagine it's the same with a lot of bands as well. Is um, you share everything, you share all the cool experiences, and you share the awful experiences. When something goes really bad or you have a bad show, you share it. Yeah. And when something's good, you get to share it as well and you yeah. laugh together. And so that's that's been really cool for me. And a lot of comedians don't get to ever experience that because they're by themselves and it's a real isolated experience a lot of the time. But I've been lucky enough to be able to share it with the guys, which is cool. And like guys from the start as mm. well. Like that's so important too. It's like so funny, literally yeah. and, and how like kind of I guess I guess we did, and I think you would too. Taking the long way is the best way. Oh, it? totally. There's peep, There's there's some awards for comedy in Australia that can sort of um, catapult you up the up the ladder a lot quicker. But um, what I say to anyone who's starting, and it's probably the case for anyone creative, is like, would you prefer for some executive or someone in power to to decide that you're going to be a star, or would you prefer to learn internally and learn yourself how? how how people what people like about you yeah. and then build your audience on people who like that about you you know what i mean absolutely instead of having to change who you are or appeal to someone else like that was our experience is we weren't ever really in consideration for awards quite fairly but what we did know is what people liked about us and from year, years and years and years it was just it was capturing more and more people who liked that yeah and mm-hmm. i guess now you look uh where you are you've got so many different things happening yeah how do you go with kind of uh multitasking all these you know creative <laughs> things that you do do you, do you burn i don't out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no it's a lot of it's 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 a lot of work but um i love it man like the all i'm hard work doesn't scare me um it, it's uh it's i quite enjoy it particularly because like I, I, you know, as, as most musicians know, I've had a lot of crappy jobs. I've worked in call centers. I've worked in customer service and yeah. all those awful jobs. 
And I still kind of know the difference between a job you enjoy and, and a job you don't enjoy. So like sitting in a room writing comedy all day, even though at some points it's stressful and hard, it's just still an absolute blessing. And like, yeah, I'm so happy with that. Do you remember the moment where you could quit your job? I do. Yes. I it was actually kind of slower than I would have liked. Like I remember yeah. we were like, I think we'd done an Edinburgh tour, a UK tour, and we're doing in the U. I think we performed in LA. I remember I performed in front of Eric Idle from Monty Python one night in LA. He did came you, to did see you know? Show. Did you know he was coming? Halfway what? through the show, I walked through the audience in a oh. bit, and I saw him sitting there, and it <laughs> set it through me. And uh, I remember like that was the most incredible night. It was so cool. And then like got on a plane home and went back to the call center the next <laughs> oh, day. Oh right, man! <laughs> and you try to relay what that's like, and they just. It's yeah. hard. They're what did just... you do on the weekend? <laughs> oh, yeah. Went to the pub. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um, the moments that you finally do get to walk out of them, they're never like, a, I, I never had the moment where I'm like, screw you, boss. Yeah. Totally. It's always just like, okay, I better step away now. I think I, I think I, I can relinquish that sort of safety net. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I love your podcast. I haven't laughed as hard. Uh, your most recent episode, and it's talking about your new show, uh, Coffee Club. I've got to sniff it here. You, Broden, Kelly, and Zach Ruane, and me. Yes. <laughs> it's about three friends who run a cafe. It's pretty good, hey? What's going on today? We're going to talk about the Show Coffee Cafe. <laughs> and if you don't like that, then you can just go away because we're going to show you things and talk about the show. And if you don't like that, then you can just say no, no, and stop listening now. Auntie Donna Podcast, go and listen. It is a 30-minute freestyle. Yeah, we do that sometimes. And it's uh, awful for the first 10 minutes. <laughs> and then we get into this zen state where we just accept <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. That's uh, what the show is. It's long-form impro that is like goes through troughs of this is unlistenable to like <laughs> our favorite moments <laughs> what's it like piecing a show like this together uh the, the new show coffee yeah, cafe yeah. this was the first show we ever tr kind of wanted to do plot and storyline so that was really exciting yeah. to us we've never ever done that before so we wrote a whole sitcom and it's my favorite it's genuinely my favorite thing we've ever done nice because um for lots and lots of years we've been very like hey watch us and yeah. this is the first show where we kind of sit back and feel like men in our 30s going, hey, here's a story. Yeah. And even for us, it's it's still quite intense because everything we do is quite, you know, yeah. 11 out of 10. But, um, I, yeah, it's some of the – like I, my reference points writing where I wanted to make sh stories that went silly like South Park or like Mighty Boosh and things like that. And I'm, I'm really, really proud we have, we've done it. I've not seen any Australian show like it. Yeah, same. Absolutely. And so, like, if, if you like it or you don't like it, do, like, that's fine. But – it's not, you can't say you've seen it before. And you, I'm really proud of that. Yeah. Big time. Do you need um, like a deadline when you're writing? Do you need mm. something to be done by here or will you just kind of keep editing? You know, when it's done. Yourself? Yeah, no, I love one of my favorite things is to be able to do a creative job and treat it like it's a normal job. So I yes. love showing up at nine and leaving at five. I yeah. think that's so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like, oh yeah, I work Monday to Friday. I get a coffee, I go in. And sit and write. It's so cool. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. What about the acting side? Like, how different is it, you know, performing to camera? Like, how long did that whole process take to kind of get used to and to kind of master in a yeah, way? Yeah, you never master. Oh, well, like, yeah, at least I don't. I, I, I can't watch myself perform. I still can't. I <laughs> really? don't know. Like, yeah. It's, um, I, I, I have a whole process and you learn how to do it and how to perform well for camera versus on stage and yeah. everything. But it's, uh, it's just a guess. Do you know the whole, like, the big mantra across everything that we do now, like, is, um, it's kind of all truth or that my big mantra is, is this true? Is this real? Yeah. Cause, um, it, and, and it's even more important when you're doing weird, absurd and, and heightened stuff is, is it coming from a place of truth? Because when you do something creative without it being grounded in something, often it's it, that's when you get stupid for stupid sake. But if yeah. you're like, often the weirdest things we've done are based off a fun story that really happened to me. There's an episode in our yeah. show at the moment where there's a whole court case that happens and Richard Roxburgh playing rake, comes in and defends him in a court scene and it's alongside a, it's alongside a section where Mark ends up in a primary school and teachers don't know why he's there and the police hold him and want to ask him questions about it and it's this whole run and it's it's a weird funny sort of escalation yeah but it's all based on my first job out of university was doing theater and education and going around to schools and doing cyberbullying plays right so like at nine in the morning in front of like 500 kids rapping about taking oh, really? pictures for you. and um it was very dorky and i remember any uh, footage of that uh, no it's all been burned and removed from the internet it's been washed yeah. Yeah. i watched the internet of it and i showed up to one of the schools at 9am one day and the other two actors who were in the show were late 
and I was starting to panic. I'm like, when's this happening? Where, what, what, are we gonna, what do I do? And I'm standing in the car park looking around and the kids are walking to their first period. And I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? And then a, te- a, a teacher walks up to me and goes, hey, mate, just wondering, what are you doing here? <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm a performer. I'm supposed to. But just like yeah, that moment, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, everything we do is based on truth, even if it's weird. Man, that's so cool. Mm, when mm. do you need to have uh, like the script done before it goes to the next process? Yeah. That's, yeah, you like, you write, we write for like three months usually. And then we don't really finish writing until we hand in the show. Yeah. Legitimately. So like, I don't know if, yeah, it's similar to music really, where like you write it for three months and it's writing is essentially going, I think a show could look like this. I think, I think this would be a good idea for a show. And then you do maybe three or four drafts. Yeah. And then you make the show and you're at, you, 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 you shoot it. And that's the second draft or like the fourth draft. It's you going, here's how I perform that idea you had. Yeah. And then you make that and then you go into the edit and that's the last two or three drafts where you're going, okay, here's what past Broden thought of an idea and this is what past oh, Broden. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you're still editing it up until the moment. And like there's been sketches or uh, jokes that we've written in the, in the writing room and by the time it gets to the final edit, you're like, nah, that, oh. that, uh, that initial concept doesn't work, but we've, we've landed on something here. So the writing process never ends. It's just different yeah, moments yeah. of it. Mm. Do you have like, uh, what's been like your ultimate pinch yourself moment throughout the whole journey? Is it meeting someone? Has it been at the end of a show where you've got people giving you a standing ovation? Is there one moment that kind yeah, of- Yeah, we have lots of cool moments. Th- the other day, the, the one that first comes to my mind is I, I got to do what I love so much- that I got to do to that I got to meet and have an, a one hour chat with Max Gorn. Yeah, I saw that. I thought that's the best <laughs> thing. Like, I'm an, I'm a diehard AFL fan. Yeah, and um, people thought what I'd do was valid enough to the point where I was sitting and had a nice chat with Max Gorn on a podcast. Yeah, and that's like that was for me is the best thing ever because I love yeah. like football and sport is like my my release and my thing I get yeah, to look at course. the weekend and so that I thought that was really cool absolutely man mm. um what's coming up for you man like it's it's busy yeah. at the moment you're going yeah. away and just actually I quickly wanted to ask please what's it like selling out a show a world tour in a day because like there's <laughs> you would know that like <laughs> oh, the, the daunting man. thing is planning it you're like is anyone going to come it doesn't matter what you're yeah, doing yeah. and then to get that phone call oh. that it's sold out in less than a day. In, for what we do, it's the best thing in the world. Like <laughs> yeah. I've, we've, we've done a few US tours yeah. and musicians will know this better than ever. You are very vocal when it's going good and then you just shut your mouth when it's not going good. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, I yeah. think most musicians, like the biggest ones in the world even, have these awful tours sometimes just yeah. because of routing. Or, of course. And, but you never really hear about it. You only hear about the positive things. So I think it's worth mentioning now. Like yeah. we've had some wonderful shows overseas, but I reckon in our second year of going overseas, we toured too much or we did too many shows uh, too close to each other. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. and we did a show in a place called Des Moines, Iowa, uh, famous for the Slipknot album Des Moines or whatever it was called, <laughs> Iowa. Yeah, yeah. We're getting and, a thumbs up from Rudy. Yeah, Iowa. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we were in a 3,000 seater and we Whoa. performed for 80 people and it was hell it was the wor- it was like once we got the show going it was absolutely fine because you just do your best job but yeah. I was like I remember thinking if we ever get to the point where we show up and <laughs> venues are full I'm going to feel so good about it and I and I absolutely do now that feeling of like yeah 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 it's I, I never want to lose that connection to like w- filling a venue is such a cool thing oh, to do oh totally mm. um did you get told beforehand that you'd only sold 80 pre-sale tickets like yeah. or did they kind of spring it on you like hey guys I knew days in advance and I was like I don't know what's better is is to walk out and see that <laughs> or to, and not to worry up until but yeah. I all for th- that was the worst part is 3 days and going how am I going to do this yeah how am I going to do it? But it was fine. Isn't it? It's funny. Like sometimes they're the best shows too. Mm-hmm. The ones you don't expect. Oh, totally. Yeah. The pressure's off. Yeah. People are more supportive. In yeah. fact, in bigger rooms, more people are like standoffish and go like, all right, well, you better be good. Yeah. 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 I don't, like, yeah. Yeah. No. Um, some of my favorite gigs from people as well have been in those tiny rooms. Mate, that's a beautiful segue. I've got a bit of a game that I want to play with you. So this is called uh, Memory Lane. And what I've done is... I've gone through Auntie Donna's gig history. Oh, cool. And I'm going to pluck out gigs from random to see what you remember oh, over the journey. Wow. So, so I'm going to take some audio. Thanks, to see, man. This yeah, is fun. Yeah, to see uh, what you remember from this. Make some noise, Jenny! Play! Play! Little plays! Little comedy! Laughing. Laughing? 
yeah. is so much fun. Tonight, we're going to try and make you laugh. And if we don't, God knows what we're going to do to ourselves after the show. <laughs> there are many different types of laughter. Here is the laugh you make when you're watching Two and a Half Men. <laughs> <Jesus>. <laughs> The joke there is that the show's a bit shit. Here's the type of laugh your dad makes when the weather lady makes a funny joke. Oh, bloody sorry, man. Bloody, <laughs> bloody bring your rake out. Yeah, bloody. Bring your fair dig it. Bring your bloody rake out. I'll tell you that. Oh, bloody hell, I'm a dad. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was the Arnie Donald News Show. And what yeah. I loved about that, man. It's such an energetic show. Oh, yeah. Like, how do you go preparing <laughs> fitness-wise for something like that? Yeah, that was brutal. That's like that. <laughs> that's theatre training that's then like been put to a billion. Like, we've just like we've just uh, we don't perform like that anymore. We've kind of <laughs> we've kind of chilled out because we would. People used to say about when we were performing. I remember a review once said it looks like they're every time they perform, it's like they're doing their last show ever. And we had that kind of, <laughs> like, you would, it was an abuse of the senses. Yeah. And, yeah, that, that particular night was our first time shooting a special. And it was in a oh, full, what's, what's that like? That was full on. It was a full... And I, At the Palais, I most think. Show, most specials city. you see on Netflix, whether it's Chappelle or Chris Rock or Hannah Gadsby or whoever, usually, and I, I don't know, like, I'm, I'm pretty sure, usually, they're over two or three nights. Yeah. Oh, and they just yeah. clip moments and go, well, I had a better run there. I did this. We had one go at that. Whoa. So that whole show's done with the tension of three guys going, we have to do this perfectly <laughs> yeah, yeah. or else it's or else it's cooked. Do you guys have like pre-show rituals that you guys do? We or do. You need yeah. to be in your own room separate? We have our, well, you can't, we, for a very long time, we couldn't, we had to share the same square <laughs> centimeter in backstage <laughs> yeah. areas. Yeah. But um, we, w the, before every show we've ever done, we do a thing called a clap-in, right? Which is uh, our acting lecturer from uni. Nice. We, so we get in a circle, we, um, we put our hands sort of apart about uh, hip width yeah. and then one of us will lead a, a, an in unison clap. And the goal is to sort of hone in and focus. And um, the goal is you can't, you should only hear one clap. And that's nice. the last thing we do before we walk out on stage. We've done it every show ever. Wow. Mm. When you um, hear uh, parts of your show back, do you remember the words? Like, do they come back? Is it like singing a song or? No, you, you that, that's, that was, I was trying, I actually couldn't remember what show that was. Oh, and really? I hadn't, I, I can't watch that because I, it's so yeah. like full on. But um, I, I, there's some sketches that we'll do on the world tour that we haven't done in a few years. And like, oh, cool. when you start rehearsing them, you start to, you, it starts to come back to you and it's dormant in your brain. But for a very long time, <laughs> you're like, nah, I'll never remember this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah. And, and, but you, there's a difference also between learning lines and then there's like a subconscious rhythm that makes people laugh more i don't know if it's yeah, i don't know if yeah. music has it where like there's just the vibe of something is something you have to kind of remember as well there's you, a there's lines but then there's vibe do you have to how long are rehearsals for a live show for you guys uh, it, it's just perfect yeah. when you watch it like how long does it take to kind of <laughs> we when we first started we do like proper like theater rehearsals so you do like you know close the doors and then bring it out and show it people show it to people yeah but then as we became less and less actors and more and more comedians over the years we started to do this thing where we would rehearse in front of people so we'd start writing ideas mm. and we used to finish the scripts and then present them and then what we started to do is to start writing them write a sentence for a joke and then perform that before it's properly written. Gotcha. And uh, what that does is it helps you learn where the funny moments are before you get too far down the line. So you start, when you're in a writing room in a closed space, you might have arguments about what you think the funniest part is or the best way to execute something. Yeah. But when you do it in front of people, it very quickly makes clear to everyone what the right answer is because it, whatever the audience is laughing at, nice. that's your goal. So you start to build a show that's kind of more well-structured because- it's built with energy, that's a crowd energy. That's a great explanation. But it's an awful thing to do because <laughs> you, it's when you're doing these shows, you do them for free. Like we do little test shows for, for people for free. We yeah, offer yeah, out yeah. free tickets. Yeah. And, fa and people who aren't fans of us, we get to come along. So it's like usually 50-year-olds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you, it, you bomb. You bomb. You, yeah, go, that'd you, be tricky. Yeah. It's like, um, you know how on, uh, on, on Krypton, Su Superman has the strength of someone to walk normally on Krypton, but when he comes to Earth, he's so much stronger and he can fly. That's what th that is, you know? It's yeah, like yeah, yeah. you get good in rooms where <laughs> yeah. you can't... If you get laughs in that room, you know something's working, yeah. and then you put it in front of a warm audience, and all of a sudden, it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, good. You know what I mean? 
Hey, I'm going to play this. It goes for about one minute 45, but we've had a lot of requests since uh, you were coming in. A lot of people were at this show. Well, now that everyone's here, we can start the show, which is fantastic. What the bloody... Oh, the car lot. What the bloody hell is this? <laughs> Boys, what's with the feathers and, and the beats? And the, and the dancing and the music? And what's with the feathers and the dance and the beats? They're dressed and like the mu- And what's with the feathers? <laughs> oh, Broden, we're just dressed up for the occasion. <laughs> After all, you did say we were hosting the comedy festival... Galah. <laughs> it's the all-stars comedy Galah. Galah? <laughs> the two things I remember are that. Yeah, what are you? There's a line in there where I, I think in the, when we were improving it out, I said, How dare you upset me in front of these many people instead of this many people? Uh, okay. And then someone, I think Sam, who writes with us, was, wrote down these many people to, yeah. to hang shit on me. <laughs> right. And then I just kept doing, I did the typo all the way to the palace. Oh, yeah. yeah. How dare you in front of these many people? <laughs> and then the other bit I remember is um, for a very long time, cause at the time I was shooting. Peter Helly is <laughs> how to stay married. Oh right! And they were like, they wanted to do a whole riff about. It. Well, you would have, you would have known if you'd come to the rehearsals. Instead, you're out whining and dining with Lisa McCune. <laughs> you're hanging out with Lisa McCune all day. And then they, and Peter Heller and Lisa McCune. You haven't got any time for it there, but then no one knew what was going on. What's it like at uh, one of those events? Because uh, you were hosting that one, so yeah. and then. All the comedians are backstage. Is it an electric atmosphere? Oh, it's an awful energy. Oh, it's the worst. It's so competitive and stressful, man. Like, yeah. to be honest. It's like festivals. Like, you go, yeah, yeah. You go into this room and every manager's there and they're sitting there like with a very stern look on their face. Yeah. And it's, for a lot of people, it's their biggest moment. It's their breakthrough moment. Yeah. And so some really nice people who are your friends, you talk to them and they're like, hi. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Good. And they're like, it's, it's everyone, everyone, I remember like, Everyone has their shirts that they wear for TV and they're sweating through them because they're like, <laughs> it's an awful energy. <laughs> I'd do, I do that for sure. Yeah, totally. What's it like when you're kind of, you're comparing it? It's like a weird thing where you don't want to upstage the comedian that's on yeah, next, yeah, right? It's yeah. kind of, what's the politics around that? Is there There's an a whole spoken thing? Because, yeah, emceeing in a comedy room is an art form. Yeah. To be able to host a show and keep the energy nice and then to facilitate new comedians coming on and making them sound really good. Yeah. And if someone does badly, how to bring the room back up to a neutral energy so the next person can go. It's a real art form. One skill, uh, an art form that we don't know how to do because we're <laughs> sketch guys. So <laughs> yeah. we've never we've never really done it. So our hope was that like we kind of knew the basic structure yeah. and uh, and hoped for the best. But our goal, that I think after, like for example, that bit you just played because yeah. We just come on and just ruin the energy of the room. <laughs> yeah. I think I think for a while we I, I think we reset for a little bit and bring the okay. audience back to neutral. Okay. Um, for whoever came on next. Because if I was a comedian, I would hate to follow that. Yeah, you know, exactly, oh my yeah. god, I'd be so scared. Yeah. So that was, <laughs> that was our hope is to not ruin the show too much for everyone. We got a message in from uh, Tony. Uh, first time he saw this, he said he puts it on repeat. Uh, you know, at least once a week. I'm going to play a snippet <laughs> from it. Uh, da- well, Auntie Donna fans will know what this is. Oh, wow. Yum, yum, yum. Mark, thank you so much for your delicious Christmas dinner. I honestly couldn't fit in another bite. Really? Because I have a Christmas pud. Oh, maybe a little bit of pud then. What a bloody surprise, mate. you got room for pud. <laughs> you love your pudding. All right, there's always a little bit of room for pud. 
Uh, thanks, but no thanks. I don't think I have room for pud. <laughs> There's no pressure. If you don't want to have any pud, bruh. Bro, um, Broden, <laughs> then you don't have to have any wood. Right, we just. Do you remember writing that skit? How that kind of came? About? <laughs> so, like, we've worked so hard on so many other things. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, so many things have worked, t- taken so much time. I reckon the, up, the the accumulative amount of time spent working on that sketch is maybe four minutes. <laughs> that is absolutely. It's, it's always the ones you don't think, right? Yeah, it's like yeah. You know, I'm sure it's the same with songs where you're like, yeah, big time. Where a simple idea just execute really simply and quickly, and that cuts through more than anything else. But then when you think about it, it's not just that four minutes. It's years and years of developing what you do and stuff, yeah, yeah. which is funny talking about that stupid video put. But people love that. Like, we put that out without much thought at all, and it just keeps <laughs> cutting through every year. That's what I was going to say. What's it like kind of having a video like that? Because I remember when you guys uploaded, I saw it everywhere, Facebook, <laughs> Instagram. What's it like to kind of have a bit of a viral moment like that? It's- it was. We found it really funny because yeah. we're like, we, our, we, were, we never thought we'd have a viral moment. <laughs> yeah. So we just kept, we just moved on immediately to like, what are the funniest things to do <laughs> with a viral video? So yeah. we- we did a Marvel slate rollout this year where we did Pud Month, where we did like <laughs> seven versions of the same video. One was like an, a commentary version of it. Yeah. We released a Christmas Pud a Pud book. Yeah, we <laughs> we just we thought like it would be funny to fully just try and uh, capitalize and be really cynical about the whole thing. Yeah. So it's good because it's it's a different kind of. There's fans who like love our back catalog and know yeah. who we are, and then there's other people who like. When we're driving down the street in Taralgon or something, we'll just yell "pud." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's a different new fan. <laughs> How cool is it to um have been uploading videos since like 2011? And for people who are mm. discovering you now to have this cool back lo- mm. back catalog of stuff they can mm. watch. It's it's really nice when you when you're making stuff, you don't really think about it. You think once you make a video, it's there and it's gone. Yeah. Um, and then you kind of as a, I often feel like I get scared if we don't do enough new content because I'm like people are going to forget about us. Yeah. But then I realized, no, it's not the case. Like people know you forever mm. um, and go back and watch your stuff and, yeah. and uh, that never goes away. Absolutely. And that's, that's really lovely because it means I have to put no work in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, it's good. I, um, yeah, people come up and discover what we do every day. And the way that YouTube and everything works now is it's, well, if you watch something, more and more stuff yeah, yeah, gets yeah, put, yeah, yeah. put in front of you. So it's, it's cool. It's really nice. Awesome, man. I'm a big fan of your podcast and uh, you got to chat to this man. Feel like a surgeon. Yes. Oh, Maddie. Getting for the very first time. Bro, what was that like? Yeah, so, okay, when we made our Netflix show, we we didn't know anyone in America. And if we'd made a TV show in Australia, we knew that we could just get all our mates in and we knew who we thought was really funny and really good. But then when we went to America, one, no one knew who we were, and two, we didn't know anyone there. Like, we knew. Yeah. And so we kept asking people, like, that. You know, and we just kept getting no's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, we asked Lil Naz to be in the show. <laughs> yeah, no. And we got a message back from his manager going, "He's he, unfortunately, he's working on music. <laughs> <laughs> he's busy with music. <laughs> um, what he does. And so, yeah, okay, yeah. fair enough, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, so, we just kept getting no's and no's, and we had these parts that needed to be, needed to be filled by people. Yeah. And then we got a, I'm like, what are we going to do? And then we got a message one day through our, through our producers going, Weird Al heard about the show and he would like to be in it if you're interested. That is so cool, man. And then we're like, yes, that would be (laughs) really nice if Weird Al Yankovic was in our show because we grew up loving him. Of course. We're massive. We're bigger comedy dorks than we are comedy performers. Mm. And uh, he showed up and just did did this. He played like a vampire for us and just did the whole part perfectly and knew and learned his lines and was really polite and lovely. Yeah. And we kind of just learned. He just, uh, he's just someone who he's a big, big nerd who loves comedy and loves doing comedy and making it. And his whole life has just been on non-cynical, positive energy. Yeah, yeah that's a really good way of summing it up. And uh, he's always supportive. He's always nice to us. We, we came to his show here in, in Melbourne and uh, he, he's just a lovely, nice, yeah. beautiful man. It's refreshing and to meet people like that, he, isn't he, it? He name dropped me on stage and almost blew my, blew my brain out the back of my head. No way. Yeah, that was really cool. So like- that's also, I think, one of the moments where I go, well, that's, uh, no one can take that away from me. Yeah, that yeah. I have that cool moment with an icon. 
Awesome, man. Uh, mm. Not only I love all your comedy, but I love the fact you're a diehard sports fan as well. Mm. I want to take you back maybe a week. Yep. Uh, how much were you cheering when this happened? The ninth 2023 MVP <laughs> from the Philadelphia 76 <laughs> Yeah, I did. I did a. I did a post. That's about Joel Embiid winning the MVP. He a diehard uh, Philadelphia 76ers fan. Yes, and I did a post saying I've never been so happy for a seven foot four Cameroonian man who I've, <laughs> who I've never met in my life. I was just so happy for this man I've never come near meeting. It's so yeah. nice. Yeah, it's just because the guy tried so hard and he's the best, and I love him, and I was so happy for him. Bit emotional recently with game six of the playoffs uh, round two, but yep. he's a gun and I love him. I like, you know, it's one of those things where like you get a bit more, philo- I go for Melbourne and uh, you get a bit philosophical in your years when you just see your team get, keep getting smashed and smashed and you start to realize that like w- <laughs> the teams you support in, in sport, yeah. it's more about the time you spend with them than the victories and the losses. It's the, it's the enjoyment that they collectively bring you all the misery. Yeah, but man, it's, yeah, it's a lifelong journey. You've actually timed that really well because the last thing I want to uh, ask you about, I'm yeah. going to take you back in time. Let's do it. Listen to this fit, last 50 seconds. The curse, the drought, <laughs> it's over. This was good. You are the winners. Extraordinary. And maybe a goal after the siren to top it off. And if he kicks this, it'll be their biggest win ever in any of their grand finals. He kicks it. Tom McDonald times the ticking. Every heart is beating true and blue for the red and blue. After 57 long years, the Demons are premiers in 2021. Extraordinary stuff. And McDonald kicks the goal. Oh. Triple M's own Brian Taylor there with the call. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, I remember after this, it was the most, like usually when nice things happen in your life, it's, you know, you, there's also trepidation or cautious. That was the most unbridled happiness I've ever felt for the longest period of time. And I'm glad I waited like 32 years or whatever yes. it was for it because I, I, I was, and I didn't even care that I wasn't there. It was, didn't matter at all to me. Maybe let's quickly paint the picture for those. So we're in Melbourne and around that time, uh, we weren't allowed to travel into state. And I remember you could only watch with, you could only watch with one other yeah, person, no, yeah, right? Yeah. So explain what it's like being a diehard Demons fan. You're going through the finals, mm. you're watching it and just this excitement. And then the games, like, how, yeah. how, how are you feeling with the whole I was, finals? I was by myself, which was probably a good thing. I was in a room <laughs> by myself, which is genuine. Like I got in, cause I was in Queensland shooting a TV show. Right. And the producers of the TV show, we're going to have a party and watch it. And I thought it will be really bad for my acting career if I watch this in front of television producers, <laughs> cause I will just go off. I'll yeah. lose my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I watched it in a room by myself. And I remember I had, I had the email, I had the laptop open, message threads going everywhere. Yeah. And it was really, it was just really nice because it was like, I think sometimes we like, I'm glad I wasn't drinking to be honest. And I'm glad I wasn't like at a pub or something. Cause I, yeah. I watched it. I took it all in. I felt every moment. And then I, I rang every mate and talk every Melbourne friend. And I talked about it and had nice thoughts and it was just. Yeah. It was a real focused Zen kind of way to experience it. Yeah. It would have been nice. I'd love to go to a one yeah. <laughs> that, you know, and be there for a grand final that we win one day. Could be this year. It was unique. It was unique. It was very special. And I'm, I'm very, very, I was just so cool. Awesome, man. Hey, this has been so much fun. We've been chatting for 40 minutes. Oh. Uh, I want to play one more game with Yarns. you uh, while you're here. On Triple M's Homegrown with Matteo, it's time for... Uh-oh. It's my party or dinner. So this is called uh, Right Party Dinner. I'm going to give you three acts, pick completely at random. You've got to write a comedy skit with them. Yeah. You can either go party with them. Yeah. Or you take them home to dinner. Oh, great. Okay. So, write party dinner. Pick completely at random. We got... All members of the Mighty Mighty Bostones. Second act. (laughs) Chili Peppers. And third act. Writing okay. a skit, partying, and dinner. We've got all members of the Mighty Mighty Bostones. Yeah. Chili Peppers, ACDC. And this is where all their primes are yeah, so partying yeah. for anything. So. And is this Bon Scott or is it? You can pick. Okay, yeah, I'd go Bon Scott and we'll have to <laughs> party with Yeah, we're, we're partying with Bon. Yeah, like just because I'd like to go to a party in the 70s. Yes. That would just be weird. I'd like to go to a pub with ACDC 
in 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 Brunswick in 1974 or something. That'd be incredible. Drinking, smoking, no mobile phone. How do you get home? <laughs> what, how, what's going on? Like that would that would be just an incredible experience. All right. Uh, so and then the mighty mighty Boston's. I would. <laughs> I th- look. They wear suits. They wear. I feel like they'd have a comedic. I scar. You got to have a sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> Great uh, song as well, but underrated, right? Oh yeah, no, it's a it's a good song, and it's also in Step Brothers, so I feel like there's a connection to comedy there. Yeah. And then dinner with um, but I I only I want to go to dinner with the Blood Sugar Sex Magic era. Yes, like um early early chapters of uh, Scar Tissue, the autobiography, <laughs> where Kiedis doesn't actually show up. <laughs> yeah, and it's a real it's a real it's a yeah. I think that's the way to do it. That's kind of like a party as well. That's like a party dinner. You yeah, get the best of both worlds. Two parties for the price <laughs> of one. That's worth early 90s chili peppers. Can you imagine? Oh, man. Uh, Brian, this has been so much fun, man. I've been a huge fan of you for so long. Uh, it's, it's so cool to see you kicking goals everywhere. You've got so much awesome stuff coming up. And it's been a real pleasure, man. Thank Congrats you, Congrats on everything you've got going. And- Can I ask you a question? Yes. About drums? Yes. Do you, what, is your favorite thing to do 16s? No, just normal. Just a normal? Your normal, Phil Rudd. Four to four. What's your favorite song that you've written the line on, like the drum line on? Uh, well, all of them. Um, Fair enough. I'm, tr- I'm trying to think. What would be the most hectic one? There's a song called This Dance is Loaded, which is pretty... This, this, actually, I'll quickly look... Oh, Please. This has got... The, I'm so keen to talk about music this with is, you. This is actually... This has got the hectic drums. I've got Jay Dealer playing still. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, so, that's incredible drums so, by so you. This is, the, this is the 16th on... Yeah. Oh, is it? Yeah, so there you go. Had it on the toms and on the hats. Far out, Brussels sprout. Yeah, there you go. That's good. You're very good at drumming. Thank you. Do you ever get sore wrists? Yes. But you got, I got to warm up. It's probably like you now when you got to do a live show or anything like that. Your voice, you got to warm up. We're getting yeah, old. Totally. Oh, man, it's so cool. Awesome, man. Hey, this has been so much fun. Come Pleasure. back anytime. Bye. For all the latest rock news, interviews, and backstage experiences, don't forget to subscribe to Triple M Rock on the Listener app.